When the dark comes rising, six shall turn it back, three from the circle, three from the track. Why should you read, if you should read, The Dark is Rising sequence by Susan Cooper? Well, this is a series I really enjoy. I read four books of it in four days. Uh, that's the sort of level of enjoyment I was having. This is nominally a middle grade or, or early YA series or sequence. Uh, it, it's called a sequence rather than a series because it's more interlocking and it's not kind of event A, event B, event C. Uh, but uh, it does all connect. Now, middle grade YA, not usually my area, not usually my age group, but this is an exception for me. It's a sequence of five books, all connected and increasingly connected over the series, but there are two sub-series, I'll, I'll get to that. Basically, there is a once and in an eon rising, the first in 1500 years of the powers of the dark, uh, which is both an eternal principle with supernatural agents, uh, but also something which recruits human beings and uh, kind of infringes on the mortal world. It's set in uh, contemporary Britain in the 60s and 70s, I suppose. And the Dark's Rising in the 60s and 70s, um, it technically takes place over two years in world. It's opposed by the light. Uh, humans usually benefit on the whole from the light, though uh, the light does not simply equate all the time to kind of, oh, just nice, good things that are lovely. We follow two main sets of characters, uh, the three Drew siblings, Simon, Jane and Barney, who are largely ordinary kids drawn into this wider war as representatives of humanity. And the second main group of characters is Will Stanton, who is, uh, on his 11th birthday, he awakens or inherits his powers as an old one the supernatural defenders of the light. Uh, there are many old ones and he is the last of the old ones and he has inherited these powers on Midwinter Eve, his birthday. And the two sub-series I mentioned rely chiefly on one of those as the character. Um, nominally, the final book does draw them together a bit, though it's mostly a will book by that point. There are two other main characters of the six, three from the circle, three from the track. There are two other main characters who are bit more spoilery to go into so I won't leave that but there are a couple more who fit in at different points. So that's the setup you know oh great there's some kids fighting darkness but what's so good about these books that means that you might want to read them? Well there's a lot and it's not stuff I usually associate with middle grade and YA. Uh, Cooper is exceptional for instance at Dread particularly in books one which is Oversea Under Stone, and four, The Grey King. By the way, these lovely covers, these are the UK Puffin covers paperback, which are the current um, series covers over here. And she's very good at dread. Uh, it's always a strength of hers. There's, you know, the shadow around the corner, the sudden danger, inexplicable things which cannot be explained away and cannot be made safe. And what's all the more impressive is she does this using fairly traditional middle grade structures. So Oversea Under Stone, for instance, particularly is a good example. It's a famous five mystery. It's a kid mystery book, but it's exceptionally anxiety inducing. Uh, it's exceptionally good at making you a bit worried about what's going on. Greenwich, uh, which is the other one mostly focused on the Druze, is the same. And they all have some of this. The Grey King is incredibly anxiety inducing as well. Uh, so maybe, I mean, if you hate that in a book, don't read them, but it's a very effective tool without there being lots of kind of crazy violence on screen or um, dramatic action. There's always that sense of dread. Uh, secondly, I think another strength of hers is a poetic uh, writing style. Cooper has a lovely prose style, is very often rhythmic, imagistic, uh, redolent, uh, resonant. It's one for prose fans, despite again it being middle grade, but it's, so it's very understandable, but it's, I think, very rich. Um, I'll go to one very, very early, um, one very, very early exchange when they have just been, the kids in the first book, the, the Drew kids have just been picked up at the train station and uh, uh, th this is this is a sample of the writing, not the whole of it, but nonetheless, here we go. The engine of uh, 
Great Uncle Mary's car gave a hiccup and a roar and then they were away. Through the streets and out of the towns they thundered in the lurching car until hedges took the places of houses. Thick wild hedges growing high and green as the road wound uphill and behind them the grass sweeping up to the sky and against the sky they saw nothing but lonely trees stunted and bowed by the wind that blew from the sea and yellow-grey outcrops of rock. There you are! Great Uncle Mary shouted over the noise. He turned his head and waved one arm away from the steering wheel, so that Father moaned softly and hid his eyes. Now you're in Cornwall. The real Cornwall. Logers is before you. The clatter was too loud for anyone to call back. What's he mean, Logers? demanded Jane. Simon shook his head and the dog licked his ear. He means the land of the West, Barney said unexpectedly, pushing back the forelock of fair hair that always tumbled over his eyes. It's the old name of Cornwall, King Arthur's name. Simon groaned. I might have known. Ever since he had learned to read, Barney's greatest heroes had been King Arthur and his knights, and so on, and they arrive in a Cornish fishing village. So uh, that's, as I say, just this slight, this kind of slightly magical moment uh, in this wonderfully described British countryside. I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but this wonderfully described uh, Cornish countryside just very quickly summed up in quite rich images. Uh, and then there's this exchange where immediately something magical is put on the table. And she's very good at that consistently and often more beautifully than that even. It leads me, I should maybe I should say magical invention. So there is magic in these books. Uh, in Oversea Under Stone, it's quite low fantasy or very much in the background. And that's very clever very well done uh, and that expands as the book goes on the books go on uh, but by magical invention i don't just mean oh here's a magical moment i more mean this slightly hypnotic crazy uh vision-like experience in some of the books particularly the dark is rising and uh, to some degree silver on the tree to some degree the gray king where just stuff keeps happening and it's just constantly a new dramatic invention or another strange experience and these pile on top of each other um, as if they're pouring out of, of Cooper. Uh, just these strange things happening and constantly they're in a new place and they're dealing with a new situation. They're, they're, suddenly they're facing riddles or, or um, kind of half riddles, half questions from the lords of the high magic who determine the nature of justice in the universe. Um, or justice in, not in terms of good and evil but in terms of law, the systems of the universe. Or again... Uh, suddenly that some of them are using magic to dive under the sea to go out to um, a strange undersea kingdom to talk to a primal force of nature uh, and negotiate with it uh, and, so, and realising that this is beyond their ken and knowledge and it just happens and then it goes to something else and then it goes to something else and she's constantly just pouring these ideas out and these images out some of which are here's a bit of magic some of which are here's a character moment some of which are um, here's a sort of plot interaction and development. Um, I think The Dark is Rising is maybe the, it's not so much in the first book, but in the second book, there are just several of these leaps and jumps to a new intense place and scene uh, with lots of often new ideas that these books are, despite being, you know, uh, as a collection, not very big, they are brimful of things, of ideas, of images, uh, of magical images. So I like that. That is a third thing. A fourth thing, magical, and, and the final thing I'll list for now, and then I'll talk briefly about the books. Uh, the fourth thing, magical world building, um, is, you know, she, she the, and by magical I mean in the imaginative sense, not the um, systemic sense. There's wonderful world building here, if you like the kind of thing that's going on. Uh, whether we're in Cornwall, Buckinghamshire or Wales, uh, the main British settings of this book, uh, the landscapes of the Welsh hills, the Cornish coast and fields beyond, um, the tree-lined avenues, river valleys of Buckinghamshire. Very rarely, I think, has there been a better realised, fantastical, but real Britain. Uh, to compare it to another enjoyable contemporary fantasy series set in Britain, Rivers of London by Ben Aronovich. Uh, ben Aronovich is a uh, workman -like at lots of things, and his world is nice, and you get it, and he's perfectly good at describing it. But for Cooper, England and Wales are magic and they feel magical when you are there. Um, they, and certainly for, as a British person, they feel very rich. And that 
early reference to Logas, even before I'd read the book, I knew that kind of there's some reflection on fantasy Britain. But that early reference to Logas and the way this fits into Arthurian, uh, the kind of Arthurian heritage of British fantasy is really interesting. Um, and yeah, that's part of where the magical invention comes from, folklore coming in, images that are local to the areas we're in, whether it's Wales or, or Buckinghamshire or Cornwall, the settings of the books. Um, the images and ideas and challenges and allies all fit into those areas, draw on their folklore. It's very, uh, very satisfying to read. And so uh, maybe that's particularly interesting for Brits, but I think it's more generally interesting. Finally, let's just talk briefly about the books themselves, because uh, you might ha want to know kind of whether they're all worth reading, what the general arc is. And this won't be spoilery, I'll try to avoid spoilers. Uh, but obviously, you know, there's some degree of, <laughs> if I say in the fifth book, all oh, things are coming to con a conclusion, don't be surprised, that's not a spoiler, that's just a, a, a general habit of, uh, of series or sequences, isn't it? So Oversea Understone is uh, about the Drew siblings, who are basically ordinary kids, and they get caught up in... Um, they find an ancient map in Great Uncle Mary's attic, or in the attic of the house they're staying at with him. And they know it's special, and well, it's the start of a quest to find a grail, a source of great power that could contain or resurrect the age-old forces of evil in the world. And the Druze are not the only ones searching for it. So that's so far so relatively ordinary. Um, the real strength of, of this book is uh, the dread that's constantly built up. Um, the fantastical British environment that's very powerful, actually, very uh, cinematic in my mind's eye. Uh, this is a perfection of the uh, kid mystery, the British kid mystery particularly, genre, uh, and it's a transcendence of it. It takes it and then turns it into a plot that has an adult heartbeat, uh, with what being very appropriate for an eight or nine or ten year old as well, but an adult heartbeat beneath it. Uh, many people would say, not everyone, I would say start with this book, this is the first. Many people would say, oh well you can just start with this book. The dark is rising, this night will be bad, and tomorrow will be beyond imagining. So Will is, he turns 11 um, on midwinter's day, and suddenly just crazy stuff starts happening. He has to find uh, the kind of the things that he needs to help him on his quest in his mission to be an old one. And uh, the great strength here is that I, I, I rated these pretty similarly. Um, many people would say this is better. I thought they were pretty similar. Uh, the Dark is Rising is very different. It's like a different genre or subgenre almost. It's not a kid mystery. It's a it's an adventure. It's a picaresque adventure through time and space with lots of weird stuff happening and um, crazy weather, a snowstorm, strange things happening, the constant threat again of uh, the agents of the dark, but now much, much more explicitly agents of the dark than in Oversea Under Stone. The magic is much more on the table, whereas in Oversea Under Stone it was bubbling under. Third, Greenwich. We're back to the Druze. They return to Cornwall, and this is the shortest of the books. Uh, it is in my edition, only 185 or 186 pages. And this is uh, often the weakest rated. I think it's solid. Uh, I enjoyed it. It has a sort of um, dynamic where you're looking through the eyes of particularly Jane who's a different character maybe to the main characters you see through the eyes of in Oversea Under Stone and it brings in other primal forces of nature uh, the idea there's not just the light and dark there's also the high magic uh, the kind of great law of the universe and also there are things that are neither that are beyond those things um, and which are scary and magical and wonderful and uh, this has a lot of crazy stuff happening in it um, uh, as well in this small Cornish fishing village um, quite uh, mystical and primordial British legend and myth almost coming to life uh, so it's enjoyable and again it's quick enough that it, it didn't overstay its welcome to me the best book The Grey King my favourite book at least you're the last of the old ones to be born on earth and I've been waiting for you uh, The Grey King um, is uh, the most terrifying opponent yet of Will. Uh, it's a Will book. He is there to um, do more questing on behalf of the light prior to the rising of the dark. And uh, in these Welsh hills and valleys, 
uh, there is a great secret war going on and a great powerful force of evil uh, inhabiting the area which Will must conquer to find the things he is looking for. And with that, yeah, without wanting to go too spoilery on it, beyond that, um, it's again strong in atmosphere, it's strong on setting, and we be also begin to see a bit more than uh, Greenwich begins to see the first real character development you see in the whole series. That's not a criticism, but books one and two, the the siblings and Will are fairly standard and and simple characters on the whole. They're interesting, they're well drawn, uh, but they're not um, great complex characters. Other characters are perhaps a bit more interesting at that point, but here in The Grey King, uh, Greenwich a little bit we see with, with Jane particularly, but in The Grey King we see a lot of development for Will, a lot of challenge, um, facing up to a new kind of situation and threat and danger. And finally, old ones, it is time for the dark, the dark is rising. Uh, silver on the tree, uh, with excellent, excellent image at the front there of what looks like Herne the Hunter. Um, and uh, Six Knights. And here, it, this is a combined novel, so technically we have everyone involved, so particularly Will and the Drew children, uh, but I'd say it's it's principally a Will book with the Drews running a subplot. Uh, and I think it's a very good book, it's the weakest book of the series for me, uh, for a few reasons. One, chiefly I think just it needed 50 more pages or something. It is the longest book in the series, uh, but it, it felt it the dark is rising has a kind of rhythmic pace thing where it's just rushing all over the place it's kind of pounding beat and this is like that but even more so there's just new stuff happening new places being visited new magic arising um new myths being drawn in new riddles being told and in that sense it came across as very slightly hurried uh, i enjoyed it a lot though i i think there's also i should say the conclusion is solid uh, without being mind-blowing but it is solid the epilogue is a bit weak um, and not terribly popular, uh, but I mean, some people will like it, I'm sure, and you can always headcanon it out. I remember a headcanon is where you load the things you don't like into the canon and fire them far away. Uh, so that's the five books. In the, in, in the fifth book, so we go uh, Cornwall, second book Buckinghamshire, third book Cornwall, fourth book Wales, uh, fifth book chiefly Wales, um, and... Uh, there's one other major, well, no, two other major places that get visited and get drawn in um, as well. And so uh, it's a satisfying sequence where that big question raised in the first book uh, with the, the poem of the six who will turn the dark back uh, comes up and is resolved very satisfyingly without, I think, it having been superly highly plotted, but it all fits together very well. And though there are a couple of things we think, ah, oh, I wish... We've seen a bit more character movement there or development there in the early parts. So, oh, I loved the fourth book, but I just wish it was a tiny bit more, uh, a tiny bit more detailed. Uh, it took a very slightly slower pace. These are small criticisms and all five books are worth reading. I would start with Oversea Under Stone, uh, but I'd understand if some people read it, then read The Dark is Rising and said, oh, The Dark is Rising is much, much better. So those are my thoughts on this series. Uh, I don't know anyone else who's read it in real life, in, in person, I've read reviews. Uh, but if you've read it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And if you end up reading it, uh, please come back and tell me what you thought about it. Till next time.